the world is trying to help. I've got my buttons wrong. We haven't we haven't met before. My name is James Collin, and I believe the world of Australian wine is beautiful and complex. So I create videos for wine lovers to learn more about the world of wine. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. On the live stream tonight, we're going to be looking at what wines do I have in my cellar in 2022 and looking at some of those, what I've added to my collection that I'm hoping to develop over the coming years, talk through why I got some of those, why I purchased some of them and my thought process behind that and share with my method for buying wine, which will be an exciting part of that. And throughout the evening, I'll also be answering some live Q&A, pulling up some questions on screen. So I actually just got to get my chat. Welcome to Nick to the stream. Feel free to put any questions um, in the chat and I'll try and answer those as I go along. I often go off on tangents as part of the live stream as well. I just want to make sure I pop out my chat and get that correctly configured so I can include you as part of this. Tonight, I'm drinking water. I'm staying well hydrated um, as part of this evening. I had a few glasses of wine with dinner, so not having too much. So I'm just sipping on water uh, this evening. As we go into this, I'll be looking at Halliday's Wine Companion um, as part of this project. And that is welcome, Nick, again. Um, good to have you on the stream and a great question to get us started. Have you heard about Metaverse wine sellers? No, I have not. That's something I'm going to Google after the stream. That sounds like a really interesting idea. I'm fascinated by how the idea of wine as something that has history behind it is going to continue to innovate in the future. I know Penfolds has already released um, wine as an NFT that you can buy the NFT, which represents the wine and you can burn that token in the future. So I'm excited by the idea of what a metaverse wine seller might look like and how that concept would work if you can have your own virtual seller. So thank you for doing that. I'll have to do some reach search on that, but I, I think there's a, there's like a whole video idea or a stream idea in that. Like I'd love to do a screen share of something like that in the future. If I can dive into the metaverse, like a video game and share something like that. So thank you, Nick, for bringing that to my attention. It's exciting to have you all here this evening. So one of the apps that I love to use is the Holiday Wine Companion website. It allows me to have a virtual seller. I've signed up to be a member there. And as part of that process, I'm able to add wines that are in their guide to my virtual collection um, as part of that to be able to keep tasting notes there, keep the age for the bottle for the recommended cellaring potential, as well as having a sense of where they were rated on the holiday scale. It's a handy tool. I also use the Vivino app. Um, I'm mostly going to focus tonight on the screen share for what I have in my holiday virtual seller. I might even add a few wines that I know that I have up here that I haven't had and inputted into the tool. So with that, let's get ready to jump into the screen share for that. So these are some of the wines um, in my wine cellar. I've got a few in there that are a little bit overdue, potentially past their best 
drink by dates. Um, let's jump into. No, I want to jump into the Tyrrells Vat 9 Hunter Shiraz. Um, in this example, Tyrrells Vat 9 Hunter Shiraz from 1995. I have zero bottles of that left. I've had that. It was a drink by date of 2003. The description was medium red purple. The bouquet is of a light medium intensity with quite fragrant aromas of licorice, spice, and the typical restrained oak usage of Tyrrells. There are interesting licorice-like flavors on the deceptively light palate with Licorice, spice, and black cherry fruit, soft tannins to close. Published 1997. I picked this bottle up because I was curious about finding a wine on the secondary market. Um, I bought this at auction to see how a wine has gone over 20, 25 years to see how it tasted to get a better understanding of what a well-aged fine wine looks like. I've had other Vat 9s. That are younger so I'm kind of aware of what it looks like when it's not as old and I've even got some VAT 9s for example from the Hunter Valley from 2011 where the description is bright clear crimson purple grapes come from the oldest and best blocks on the estate the Ashman's Vineyard with its striking red volcanic clay soils hand-picked and fermented in open vats before maturation for 16 months in new and used 2,700 litre French casks. However good John Shiraz may be, this wine has greater intensity, drive, length, with persistent fine tannins and positive but balanced oak. This is another wine that I picked up at auction, trying to get a sense of how the Tyrrells Vat 9 Hunter Shiraz goes over various different years with the quality, the balance, um, the taste. That one has more than a decade on that. I'd probably have four bottles left um, in the cellar and I haven't updated the count there. And this wine is expected to go well beyond that. It's bottled under Scrooge Cap. The previous bottle was under cork so i'm hoping that this vintage will have longevity and continue to pr improve with age but it's great fun opening a bottle of wine that has some age on it already i'm moving towards buying wines that have greater value but sellability that i like that are more affordable I can't afford to keep buying $100 bottles um, as part of that. So I'll jump into a recent acquisition. Um, I love the Thomas Synergy Vineyard Selection Hunter Valley Shiraz. I tasted this up on my hun honeymoon when I was in the Hunter Valley for the first time and loved it. From the scent, I also burnt my mouth that morning that I tasted it um, on a hot, long, black cup of coffee. So I enjoyed its texture, but I didn't fully appreciate its taste. Um, but I enjoyed its fragrance, and I had another bottle later on and confirmed that I really enjoyed this wine. It rated highly in James Halliday's Wine Companion um, for. 2021 um, for the wines there and it was a great value wine at $25 a bottle so I was able to pick up um, 12 for that to put away in the cellar for a bargain hoping that will last till 2038 maybe stretch to 2040 even a little I might have 10 bottles of that left um, aging in the cellar so multiple vineyard sources separately vinified the high quality vintages shine through the expressive dark buried filled bouquet into a sculpted medium bodied palette its freshness and savory fruit 
oak tannin balance guarantee it will develop superbly over decades. This is a value plus wine as well. So that's exciting to see um, as part of this offering. And I'm wondering if the curse of a microphone Let me uh, just jump back, potentially check how things are going. I just realized that my audio may not be coming through properly. I'm just nervous. I just looked at my uh, sound bars um, in OBS, so got a little nervous um, that my audio is not working. So that's why I'm asking that question. Um, I just updated OBS in the background, which is how I do the live streams. So thank you for the confirmation, Nick. I just wanted to double check that to confirm that things are coming through loud and clear because my soundbars are not usually working like that. And Ian is right. We uh, do not have edibles, um, so it's not legally able to be obtained over here uh, to see how that would work with high-end wine. Um, it is not legal at the moment. Um, so I cannot comment on what that would be like as an experience. I'm Sydney based in Australia, so that is not currently something we are able to do, uh, in Australia as part of that, that'd be potentially an experience you need to go overseas for, um, where there's different laws, rules, and regulations to be able to find edibles. We jump back in to the screen share. I am Sydney based, so Sydney, Australia. So I'm a stone's throw away from the Hunter Valley. And it's one of the reasons that I love Australian wine and seeing the variety of expressions from all over Australia and the wine that we produce and the huge variety. I love its complexity and all the different things that go into it. And I love sharing about the world of wine as part of this. Uh, as I was exploring auctions, as I jump back into the screen share, I have enjoyed the Penfolds Bin 150 Marananga Shiraz. I picked this one up um, at a lower price point. So this is in retail for about $100 per bottle. Um, I picked it up for less than that um, because I found it on auction. I think I got it after Penfolds released um, a lot of their seller release wines in the market. And I'm my conjecture, I think people might have been oversubscribed to that. So they've released um, some of those, uh, which was interesting. So really good seeing some of the complexity that has come through from this this wine i've really appreciated some of the chocolatey notes that have come through with age and i'm interested to see how that wine will go over the long term i maybe have 10 or so bottles of this left and the notes on this one is i'm a, being a believer in the exceptional quality and style of this wine from the first vintage and this simply builds on that belief spends 12 months in an oak cocktail of new and used French and American oak and is a powerful testimony to the generations of knowledge accumulated by, Pen, by the Penfolds team, guiding the positive use of oak without in any way diminishing the fruit. The allure of the bouquet is immediate, as is the deliciously grainy texture of the mouthfeel and the almost decadent well of black fruit flavours. So this one's a really interesting and awesome wine to taste and seeing that evolution 
over time. I'm really interested by seeing the wine, buying wine in lots of um, four bottles, uh, six bottles, or I don't have 12 fingers, but 12 bottles to be able to buy enough wine that I can seller it and track its quality and development over time so if i want to sell a a wine for a decade or 12 years and i have one bottle every year to see how it's developing then i get to see how that wine evolves and changes and develops over time which is something that i really am excited about seeing the wine as a living thing that there's these chemical reactions going on in the bottle over time helping the wine to change and develop and learning about that and seeing what that's like and following the journey uh, from a young wine to a fine wine that is beautifully aged and using that experience to kind of figure out what does where's that wine at its drinking peak for me recognizing that cellaring wine is something that is personal to every individual's taste and what's going on there for what they enjoy and what their favorite wines are as part of that process and understanding do I prefer an old wine that has these beautiful tertiary characteristics with uh, less prominent fruit characteristics or do I find a wine with its well-balanced of the fruit characteristics have leveled off and some of those tertiary earthy characteristics, chocolatey characteristics are coming out and they're well balanced. And is that balance the thing that I enjoy most? I'm still figuring that out, but cellaring wine helps me figure what out what that looks like on my journey and putting different wines in the cellar um, as an experiment is part of that. And have I ever had a trip to Europe? I've traveled to Europe. I've enjoyed um, England, London. I've been to the Netherlands um, as part of that. I have not yet got to France. I have found a place in Sydney that offers Greek wine, which is awesome. I have a wine that's not rated here that I can't remember what its name of, but it's a Greek variety imported from Greece. To Australia that was quite interesting um, and it was a wine variety that I'd never heard of before which was really enjoyable um, and yeah I've started enjoying Tempranillo and I think off the top of my head that's a Spanish origin variety and it'll be interesting to compare um, some Australian grape variety or Great varieties that are grown in Australia that are well known overseas. So comparing a French Pinot Noir to a Australian Pinot Noir and seeing what wine tastes better and is more enjoyable at $25, for example, doing a blind tasting of that, comparing potentially uh, a Spanish Tempranillo versus an Australian Tempranillo and comparing those two differences um, as well. And have I ever been surprised by cheap over-the-counter wine? I've probably recently more uh, committed and bought into subscriptions um, as part of wine clubs in the last year or two. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, Jacob's Creek and McWiggins in Australia for offering some great value for money under that $10, $15 um, Australian price point, um, the two wines that jump to mind that I think of with that example is Jacob's Creek's classic Riesling fresh, crisp, fruity, um, apple notes there, um, as well as the McWiggan black label red wines, the, the red blend or the Shiraz is something that it's quite easy, drinkable, um, enjoyable. But then there's also kind of the finesse and complexity as price increases. So figuring out what value for money looks like for what I enjoy um, and my tasting palette is also a fun part of the palette. 
and yeah, like you can have different levels in of sweetness in wine, um, often denoted through uh, residual sugar, and part of the sugar is how dessert wines are made. The grape sits on a vine, sits there for a lot longer, and with the length of time the grape sits, it develops kind of more concentrated sugars, which then go into the fermentation process. And if fermentation is stopped early, there's a higher sugar content in the wine and a potentially lower alcohol content because fermentation is the process of converting sugars into alcohol. So a quick way to figure out if a wine is sweet as a quick little rule of thumb, a little guide is if a wine has a lower alcohol percentage, it is likely to be sweeter because the fermentation has been stopped earlier on. You can see that particularly in Moscato's. Um, I tried a sweet wine recently. Um, it wasn't necessarily too sweet, but it was something that was, it was almost this candied lemon zest going on that put me off with kind of some orange marmalade combined together. And the orange zest put me off and I was like, mm, not really for me. My wife loved it. I didn't. So she's going to enjoy drinking that bottle. I'm not. Um, whereas there was a different one that was a dessert wine that was kind of that orange marmalade. It was sweet, but the flavors within that sweetness also was a lot more enjoyable. And as that off topic question, I use a mic from Rode. I use the Rode Video Mic NTG um, for that. And I also use that on my kind of 90D camera, camera when I'm out and about um, to record my videos. And that's what I use kind of for all my content plugged into my PC running through uh, NVIDIA broadcasts to go on a nerdy um, off topic there. So let's look at another one of the experimental wines in my cellar. If we jump back in. Swapped to the wrong screen. So the Heirloom Vineyards Alcala Macaron Vale Grenache was a wine that I picked up from Qantas Wines. It was something I bought because I was getting bonus Qantas points. I didn't really realize it had cellaring potential because I was trying to get Qantas points as part of this, but I kind of looked it up um, and I bought it kind of three years um, in a row um, as part of that to see well, I was getting the Qantas points at first and foremost, but this was the first time where I kind of came across the idea um, of a vertical tasting where you taste one wine, in this case, the Alcala McLaren Vale Grenache, across different vintages to see how those different years go compared to each other and how they've progressed over time. So I found um, that by looking at, the 2017, 2018, and 2019, I have bottles of each of those in my cellar. I think I bought them by the six pack, if I remember correctly. So I'll be interested to see when I stack those up against each other. I've actually been meaning to compare the three, three vintages next to each other um, to see how they taste. I just have not got around to it because it's something I've wanted to do um, and share with friends. Um, but the pandemic has been something that has uh, presented um, that from happening um, as much as I would like it to. Um, I also enjoy um, thinking about kind of wines in the cellar that are kind of like uh, more trophy wines, special uh, memories that go with them. Um, so I kind of often go through the process of using the holiday wine companion to find and research my wines of like, Oh, what, what do I want to um, add to my cellar, put in my cellar 
Um, so another one that I like. I You can see from my seller that I've got a strong bias towards uh, Shiraz. One that I added recently was the 12 bottles of the Valley Floor Shiraz. I just really enjoy uh, the Suma Plum that comes out of that with its notes. Um, I just enjoy that fruit flavor and the chocolatey uh, notes that go with it. Um, I've got, it's unrated at the moment by the looks of things for that 2019 vintage. And I'm not sure if that will load. Let's try just doing it through uh, the good old edit the URL. No. Uh, the 2019 looks like it is yet to be rated. Um, I've got one bottle of the 2018 um, wine here. Uh, 2019, I've got a dozen in cellar. Um, as part of that. So I enjoy that. White wines are something I don't really go into um, with cellaring. Another example of a wine that I know that I have. So, for example, I also have picked up a 2011 uh, Kiss Shiraz, so I can quickly add a bottle of that um, to my cellar. Uh, so I need to check the price that I paid for this as well. But I know I have one of these that I bought. Uh, I'll just put in zero because I can't remember what it was. But I know I have one of these waiting, developing, aging. Um, so looking forward to seeing how that progresses over time as well. Um, an age-worthy uh, wine from a well-recognized vineyard as part of that. Uh, that's more of a trophy wine coming in at a hundred dollars a bottle. Um, so I'm kind of balancing uh, this and that. Um, one of my other purchases that taught me something uh, in the last 12 months, it was another one of those, oh, this looks like a, a good value wine going on here, was from Wins. So let's see if I can find the uh, Wins. Fighting from 2019. So it's the Winds Siding Cabernet Sauvignon from 2019. Let's see if I can navigate to it going through the 2018 vintage. Uh, so it was the 2019 vintage. Um, this was also rated by um, James Halliday. I ended up picking up some of the 2020 vintage by mistake as well. I went to the bottle shop, loved this wine so much. I bought six bottles then I tried to buy another six bottle, 12 bottles. Um, the next delivery was like six 2019 and six 2020. So I ended up being able to find about 12 of the 2019 vintage to put away. And I got some 2020 uh, with it as well. But the one that I wanted to focus on was the value of the 2019 uh, vintage. Haven't managed to find that quickly because there was also two reviews. So there's one by Aaron Larkin. There's also another one by James Halliday that rates it a little bit more highly um, and gives it greater cellaring potential over time. But I enjoyed this wine, picked up 12 bottles. Uh, the list price here is $20, but I was able to find it for $13 a piece. So I was really excited about this particular wine um, as one of my purchases. And I'm interested to see how that goes until kind of 2040. Um, as part of that, seeing how that Cabernet Sauvignon uh, develops, and I'll be really interested and starting to get a little bit more 
um, interested in that Cabernet Sauvignon style of wine and looking at comparing that at wines from Bordeaux in France and seeing how an Australian Cabernet Sauvignon well served stacks up some from something from Bordeaux and comparing how Australian wine compares to the international counterparts as well. Let me jump back in to the camera only mode, look at some of the questions in the chat. Hey, from Akira, hey James, would you know if a wine is cheap or expensive without seeing it? That is a great question and I'm looking forward to trying sometime. I need to get some friends together to see if that would work. Um, I'm planning on trying to do a wine tasting where I look like a $10, $20 bottle versus a $50 bottle versus a $100 bottle to see if I can tell the difference. Um, there's people who can have like thoughts that knowing what the price is of the wine um, is something that psychologically influences you to enjoy the wine more because you think you paid more so you should enjoy it more. Um, I think I've... Let me see if I can put Google in front of me. Um, research about price and wine quality. Um, thinking about how people perceive um, the per, uh, perception. Um, so I'm a little bit of a nerd at times. So uh, I love a good study. So jumping back into the screen share to help kind of answer that question in more detail. Price information influences the subjective experience of wine, a framed field experiment. Um, so the highlights from this first study, manipulating wine prices using a framed experiment, blind intensity ratings differ for three wines of different price and expert writing. Blind pleasantness ratings do not differ for the same three wines. Pleasantness of the budget wine increased when presented with a fake higher price. That's often quoted that price influences our perception of wines. So that's kind of a study that some scientists have done. I should bookmark that and read that a little bit later on and see what that's more about and understand the methodology. Um, but there's interesting things that influence if someone knows the price you might perceive a wine better. So doing a blind tasting is the way to go to try and compare uh, the expensive wine versus the cheap wine. See if you can pick it. I need to get some friends over to help me do that so I don't bias myself uh, by picking or I'll kind of know what the wines are before it is. So I've got to figure out a way not to like rig it so I know because if I know, if I've read the tasting notes for a wine and I remember them, when I've purchased it, I can kind of guess off the tasting notes. So it's just trying to make sure it's even to be able to tell what it is. I almost need to get friends to pick up a bottle uh, blind for me so I don't actually know what it is or have anything to expect about it. But that's like a, a wine game that I want to play. Can I guess the cheap expense wine to the expensive wine? Um... And then kind of the tasting process of kind of just drinking it, putting it in like a, a paper bag so you don't actually see the label, having it lined up three different glasses. You sniff, you smell, and try and get the scent of the wine, get the fragrance of it, um, and drinking it responsibly as well. So spitting to be able to taste the wine without getting your taste sensation impaired. I... You can get drunk from drinking wine. You can get drunk by consuming alcohol in quantities. So just being conscious of that. I try and make sure I drink responsibly and make sure I follow the government guidelines to not... I think it's... Or I have to go back and look it up so I know it off the top of my head. But I think the Australian government guidelines are no more than four standard drinks on any given day and no more than 10 standard drinks in any given week for men uh, to minimize the risk of uh, harm from consuming alcohol. Um, and that's all alcohol, not just wine. Um, but it's really important to check 
is your wine 13.5%, 15%? Um, answering the next question, I've had, I've got some wines on my shelf that are ones I want to share with friends um, because they're like a 15% Shiraz, so a higher alcohol Shiraz, um, as well as if I open up like a Tawny that is like 20%, um, higher alcohol again. I think one of the highest alcohol wines um, that I've had was a friend bought over something called uh, a cognac, which is like a brandy wine, which was 40% um, from I think a French designation um, there. So that was a 40%. It tasted much closer reminded me more of whiskey than it did of wine, which was interesting. So I've got to understand more about what kind of brandy and wine and going on there is with grapes. Um, cause that's in the kind of 40% mark. So I kind of associate it more with whiskey. And another question from Nick's, what would be the perfect date wine? Is it true that women prefer sweeter aged wines? The, answer for this is it depends what people like. I know my life has a uh, leaning towards uh, wine that is sweet. Not sure how that goes across different demographics. I know in Australia, Shiraz is one of the most produced grape varieties as part of that. So it depends on who's consuming that. But if you want to find, this is wine picking advice. If you want to find the perfect date wine, find a restaurant with nice food, preferably with a wine list that has a lot of options by the glass and a sommelier and being able to have a conversation with the sommelier about what kind of wine you like and getting their suggestion and recommendation for food pairings of what your wine will drink with. So one of my go-tos is if I'm having a steak, I'll often go for the sommelier's recommendation, which could be a Cabernet Sauvignon to pair with the steak because of this tannin structure um, of that Cabernet Sauvignon coming together to balance out that steak and the fat and the meat as part of that. Um, will be part of having that come together as a food pairing experience that I personally really uh, enjoy for that. It is something that I think about, get the sommelier's recommendation and give them the opportunity to explore wine and choose a wine that they like. And by the glass menu is something that helps do that. Or if you're willing to explore and taste and see and understand their taste. You can potentially uh, share a bottle of whatever your date prefers um, to be considerate and thoughtful of trying to pick something that they like and enjoy. I think buy the glass is always the safest option because then you don't, you can try a wine without committing to the full bottle um, as part of that when you're at dinner. And one that is, Controversial, what is your opinion about people that use wine to fight anxiety and depression? Do you think it helps? My recommendation, if it's a medical condition, get someone for professional help uh, who's like a psychologist or a mental health professional to get their uh, professional advice on that and what it does for them. My hot take on that is Caffeine and alcohol are drugs. They influence your system. Coffee, caffeine is a stimulant. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, which impacts you in different ways. Um, if someone is using alcohol to self-medicate, it's probably an encouragement to intervene as a friend and encourage them to get the help and support of a medical profession for that which is a really straight, clear um, piece of advice that a medical profession is someone, someone is handling their anxiety and depression in a way using alcohol. They 
I would recommend you look up and refer them to professional help um, would be my most clear thought that I want to capture there. So Nick's question on a trip to Albania had their feet in dirty, dirty feet wine. Um, there was a body, full body of complex flavors. Do you think dirty foot pressing helps with the chemical process? It's a really interesting way. Like, like it's all going in together when the wine is being made. It's something that was thought to be the traditional method of making wine before the basket press came along. You will also be kind of the great drops to the ground. I, if it's in the same dirt, um, similar things. But the good news is alcohol is can act as a disinfectant um, and kill other germs to help stabilize that. Um, and then also the yeasts. Um, winemakers need to pay attention to cleanliness um, of whatever they're fermenting the wine in to make sure nothing else grows alongside that fermentation process. Um, I've seen that in practice with kombucha, being able to put sugar, tea together in with a kombucha scoby to grow that. You need to make sure everything is clean, otherwise you create a foul, disgusting mess um, if the wrong things grow together. It'd be interesting to see and understand that nerdy complex level about like, is there things that are part of the foot pressing process um, that add to the wine, um, especially if the grape skins are left on. Um, I'd be really curious about that. Um, I think if you are pressing wine that are in hundreds of liters that then go into a 750 mil bottle. Um, uh, my knee jerk reaction is there'd be a little bit um, of an impact, but it would be marginal if you're helping like stomp and press on um, a whole hundreds and two hundreds of liters of wine, just like the practical service area of how much juice is in the wine that you're pressing compared to how big, uh, your feet are versus then the alcohol content and the soaking of the barrel. There's just so many factors that go into the wine making process. I'm not sure how much it would move the needle in terms of contributing to the complexity, the nerdy kind of what would this look like in the scientific method. You'd almost have to have a control with foot pressing, basket press, potentially machine pressed to see the difference between the three methods um, to see what it is um, as part of that. And Meme Man has also added in that professional help is something that is important um, with Kira's previous question. Drinking responsibly is an important part of consuming alcohol and enjoying wine um, over the long term. So going into my uh, cellaring philosophy again, uh, there's also a whole bunch of articles on the holiday website talking about um, wine cellaring. Um, they often have uh, different things on there so most recently uh, open that bottle night is something that is part of the calendar for me that I think about what is happening on the 26th of February uh, 2022 um, the last Saturday in February um, a Dorothy Gator and John Breacher from the Wall Street Journalists as columnists created the Open That Bottle Night in 2000. We aim to motivate people to connect over a bottle of wine. In 2022, the hashtag OTBN is a global event that brings people together to drink that special bottle that they've been saving. Held on the last Saturday in February, Open That Bottle Night is your cue to check your cellar for any bottles that are hitting their prime and a reminder that we can create memories without needing a reason to celebrate and add these wines to the list. For me, I opened up a bottle of the Ross Hill Pinnacle Shiraz 
uh, from 2011 um, to share with some friends that night, which was awesome. So being able to open and share wines for the seller for special occasions and also make it a special occasion is one of the reasons that I wanted to create a seller and think about the wines that I'm putting into that and seeing how it is going to develop over time as part of that. So it's a really interesting uh, concept and I'm part thinking of being more intentional about making sure I buy wines with screw cap. Screw cap wines don't suffer from something called cork taint. When you put a cork in the bottle of wine, cork is a natural substance that can leak. It can also cause cork taint that wrecks the wine and makes the wine go bad. Um, so there's a saying, there's no good old wine. There's no good old wine. There's only good bottles because of the variability in the cork that seals an odd bottle. So I'm trying to be more disciplined about buying wines that I enjoy that are made under screw cap to be able to have longevity, um, take the benefit of the screw cap of keeping the wine sealed and fresh um, throughout that cellaring process. I have some storage at home. I've got some offsite storage as well um, that is climate controlled, humidity controlled, uh, to keep the wine cool under lock and key um, to help save space at home as well as keep that wine in the right con conditions for the wines that I want to um, age in the long term. And I really love the Wine Companion website that Halliday have put together because they've got all kinds of great articles about kind of wine, wine storage they partner, they're journalists, they partner, and they're writers, so they partner with content partners within the space. So this is an ad for, let's see, Holiday Pray Promotion, an ad for the Lieb Her wine fridges. Um, an aspirational goal for mine is save up and buy a wine fridge um, to put some bottles in at home um, as part of that instead of just having kind of a, a wine rack uh, open to the uh, varying heat of Australian summers going up to potentially 40 degrees Celsius to make sure the climate for the wine is well controlled. Um, they also start a wine cellar. They have some good guides on here. I just They also publish things every Saturday. Um, so I enjoy reading their articles on the regular about all things wine related. So resources, oh, once I get it to load, I'm clicking too quickly. Resources, wine education, wine uh, cellaring. As part of that, I use their virtual cellar. Um, creating my dream cellar is something I'd love to do. Um, but they also have different things uh, going on as part of that. It's so like 10 rules for cellaring wine. Uh, consistency trumps temperature. Ensure there's darkness. Balance is best in the wine between acidity, tannin, and fruit uh, to help the age wine, wine, help the wine age for the long term. And hands off, leave your bottles to avoid vibrations. So vibrating fridge or next to a thoroughfare where footsteps will disturb their sun lumber. So it can be recommended you don't keep wine under the stairs because of that, because of the vibrations of going up and down stairs, unless you have figured out a way to uh, insulate the wine from the vibrations. Uh, buy multiples was like what I was talking about, buying wines in four, sixes, or twelves um, to see how wine changes over time. Um, go beyond your favorites. I'm looking to expand into Pinot Noir in 2022 um, to add Pinot Noir wines to my cellar, some more Cabernet Shiraz potentially, um, as well as potentially 
some Grenache and some Blau Frankish, looking some alternative wine varieties. Um, I've been going very much Shiraz, 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 looking to expand um, the number of red wine varieties that are in my wine cellar to see how they age over time because my chests are going to uh, change over time. Cork Care needs the right amount of humidity and the bottle is laying on its side. Um, I need to get better at using uh, a system to keep track of my wines and the virtual cellar um, is part of that. And Cellar Doors Coll commonly offer samples of museum wines is one that I love. So doing my own research, uh, tasting wines um, where wine tastings are offered for new museum releases to see how wine has gone over the course of a decade. And also it's great to create a re occasion, invite friends over for dinner, have board games, uh, to break out a bottle of wine to share with each other is also a great part of the fun as we think about what was in my wine cellar for 2022. So that's kind of only a fraction uh, of what I have. Um, I've probably got over 150, 200 bottles. Um, I try and think about strategically what I'm buying in lots of 12 or 6 uh, to put in my wine cellar to see how they go over time because they're the big purchases that I'm making of chunks of wine to see how they develop. I also kind of bought buy bottles here and there because I'm like, ooh, this is interesting. Ooh, that's interesting because um, I love wine and love exploring the world of it, but I'm trying to be more disciplined about buying wine um, in lots of four, six, and 12 as part of that. And I believe Nick is speaking from personal experience when he's thinking about cork tank um, compared to screw cap. Um, as part of that, um, and Akira uh, live um, at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every uh, Australian Eastern Daylight Time at the moment, Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Eastern Standard Time is different in America, um, but 9 p.m. Wednesday nights, Australian Eastern Daylight Time at the moment, or Australian Eastern Standard Time once daylight savings um come back and thank you Nick for the well wishes I stream regularly on Wednesdays to create content share interact um, with a community of wine lovers try and help share wine education my love of Australian wine because I make videos for wine lovers to learn more about the world of wine so thank you for tuning in um, would love your comments about potentially any recommendations for Nick if you've tried some French wine what French wine would you recommend me looking and seeing if they're available um, in Australia potentially around that $25 uh, price point which could be about like 12-ish euros 15-ish US dollars um, I'm looking at doing some comparisons in future videos about comparing um, Australian wine uh, to other Varieties that are well known um, from places like France, Cabernet Sauvignon against Bordeaux, Pinot Noir against Burgundy and things like that to see um, what it's like in a blind tasting of can you pick one over the other? Do you enjoy the French wine more than the Australian wine? Um, to see what that is like. And Ian also asks, is wine addictive? I'm not sure is the short answer. Um, I think alcohol dependence is a medical thing you need to be concerned about and needs professional help, but I don't believe it is addictive in the same way as caffeine or nicotine. Uh, my anecdotal experience from that is caffeine from coffee it gives me headaches and I get withdrawal symptoms from caffeine. Um, as part of that, more frequently than I do notice things for not having a glass of wine if I don't drink for a week. Um, whereas if I don't have coffee for 24 hours or 36 hours, a little bit of a headache comes in. So that's kind of my anecdotal experience from that. So thank you for tuning into the live stream. If you have any questions about the world of wine, 
please throw them in the chat and I'll try and answer them on the live stream. Otherwise, I will write them down, put them in my little app to potentially create a video about them in the future on my YouTube channel or think about it as a topic area to cover on a live stream in the future. So thank you for tuning in. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to be notified of more wine videos uh, from my YouTube channel. And if you hit the bell, bell icon, that'll definitely notify you. But otherwise, thank you for uh, joining me tonight, uh, coming along for the ride uh, as part of that. And one last question. Speaking of caffeine, have you discovered any flavorful beans recently? I also like going off on tangents. Um, I have recently discovered... Um, if I jump into a screen share, going off onto a coffee tangent, uh, ONA is a brand, um, that I always pronounce O, Ona, but then I found out it's pronounced Ona, um, like H-O-N-O-U-R, um, which is cool. Um, having a sustainable approach, uh, to that, they've got a huge variety uh, of beans and notes that go through that, which is cool, having them broken up by espresso and filter um, as well. I think I picked up a decaf coffee when I was running low um, because I was curious about that to see how it was, and it was pretty good, but they've got some variety there, and they have a focused on sustainable coffee as well as part of that. So something that I enjoy and connect with as part of that. Um, going off on a coffee tangent, one of my other great joys. So keep an eye out for owner cafes and beans or owner, owner beans at cafes near you. Um, if you want to try some, they have a variety of different things from different origins. Otherwise, yeah, thank you for tuning in here this evening and I will see you in the next live stream and enjoy the jazz music. <laughs>